This is a WVUA 23 News Special, Alabama's rich political history. Here's Jack Royer. On this Labor Day 2016, we're just two months away from an historic presidential election in this country, in which Alabama will likely vote Republican. Our state has been reliably red, with only a few exceptions, for nearly five decades. But instead of looking ahead, tonight we're looking back at Alabama's rich state political history with our political analyst, Steve Flowers. Steve served in the Alabama legislature for nearly 20 years and through a lifetime in Southern politics has made friends and acquaintances with some of the most significant and colorful figures from our political past. He tells their stories in his book of Goats and Governors, six decades of colorful Alabama political stories. So tonight, 30 minutes with Steve Flowers talking about a subject he could talk about for days, unique and always exciting politics in the heart of Dixie. You've practically grown up in Montgomery at the at the state house. Well, I just have always been enthralled with it. I guess when I was a little boy, I don't know why I got so interested in it, but I started being interested as long as I've always known. I'm in my mid 60s now, so I've been around Alabama politics for close to over 50 years. Tell me about your time in the legislature. How long did you serve? I was elected in 1982. I was 30 years old and uh, served for 16 years from uh, 82 to 98 and got out in 98 and uh, started writing a political column about three years after that. So I've been writing my political column, my statewide political column, for about 15 years now. What were your goals growing up? What did you like about politics? What did you love about, was it the, the grandeur of it? What did you find so enthralling about it? I just liked the whole game of politics, the history of it. And I uh, came here to the University of Alabama, majored in political science and history, which I knew I would do. Uh, you know, and, and uh, went back home and went into business and then went to the legislature soon thereafter. The politics of Alabama is really interesting, though. And you talk about that in the book. What was it that created the Alabama political landscape we see today? Why is Alabama a red state now and probably as long as you or I will be alive? And I think that, I think you would agree with that. I would. Alabamians uh, have always been very independent people. The party thing is very interesting. We really have been a no-party state in Alabama. You can go back to Reconstruction. People wonder why the South was Democratic for close to 90 years. From 1877, the end of Reconstruction, to 1964, Alabama was a Democratic state. That means every office holder on the state level was Democrat. It was governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, every Supreme Court seat, every legislative seat. It was just a traditional thing. The reason being that coming out of the Civil War, people don't realize this, but the radical Republicans around Abraham Lincoln after Lincoln was assassinated, they invoked Reconstruction on the South. Reconstruction was so harsh from those 15 years that white Southerners decided that they would never vote for a Republican as long as they lived. Matter of fact, my first campaign for the legislature in 1982, out in rural areas, they'd say, Steve, you ain't no, no Republican, are you? And I, and I said, no, I'm running as a Democrat. Well, my granddaddy rolled over in his grave if I voted for a Republican. That was the old saying. You'd have people say they voted for a Republican. When Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Bill, him being a Southerner, and when he signed that bill, he said, I've just, I've just signed the South over to the Republican Party for the rest of my life. And he, his, his, his words became poetic. And in 64, you go back to 64, Alabama's voted for a Democrat only one time. Jimmy Carter in a very narrow race in 76 as president. So we became a, a totally Republican state and have evolved in just a totally Republican state now. What is, what is it like? to have served in a time and grown up in a time politically in Alabama when in order to win you had to be a racist. But interesting, interesting about this, Jack, Alabama, coming out of the 1920s, race was not an issue because African Americans couldn't vote. They had been relegated basically to being semi-slaves. Mm -hmm. They were in a caste system where they were not allowed to vote and so that they weren't a factor politically because African Americans could not vote. But going back to the Depression era in Alabama, you go with our congressional delegation of the 1920s, beginning in the 20s with the Depression, through 64, 
there was a 20, there was a 30 year period there from 1935 to 1965 where we were a progressive democratic state. We weren't just Democrat by label, mm -hmm. by tradition. Our congressional delegation's voting record was as liberal as New York's because our congressional delegation embraced the New Deal. They were the most staunch supporters of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. That was shocked people know we had nine congressmen and all nine of them were some of the most liberal progressive voting records in the country but it brought home the bacon to Alabama too. <laughs> we, we brought home the bacon. Right. That, that, we had the most seniority laden congressional delegation. We had two most powerful senators in America in Lista Hill and John Sparkman. And, uh, and we had congressmen like George Grant, Sam Hobbs, Henry Stegall was chairman of the banking committee. They were all FDR New Deal Democrats. Lister Hill was, John Sparkman was. But the major things that were attracted to Alabama at that time were done by that Congress delegation. All the military bases, Maxwell Gunner and Montgomery was brought here by Lister Hill. Um, John Sparkman brought Redstone Arsenal to Huntsville. Uh, everything you see was done during that progressive era. Here we are sitting at the University of Alabama, but there was a prototypical career pattern for every one of our politicians in the state. Come every, here. Every one of them came here. Every one of them were in the machine. Every one of them. We had nine congressmen when I was a little boy, and both of our U.S. senators were products of the machine in Alabama. Lister Hill started the machine. The machine in Alabama was the training ground for political people. What they would do is they'd come here, get in a fraternity, belong to the machine, be active in campus politics, go back home and practice law a little while, then go to Congress. And they all had the same, it was almost the same thing. If you read the biography, it's almost identical. Oh, I know. I was <coughs> on the steps of Reese Pfeiffer for the homecoming parade last year, and a friend of mine leaned over and said, the back of that float right there has got your governor in 20 years. And I, there's some truth to that. Still to come, we mentioned Alabama has been a reliably red state with only a few exceptions. One of them, 1968, when the Heart of Dixie voted for the independent candidate for president, their own George Wallace. The best, uh, attribute you can have in, in politics is being able to remember people's names. Next, Steve Flowers remembers one of the most influential politicians in Alabama history when this WVUA 23 News special, Alabama's Rich Political History, continues. You're watching a WVUA 23 News special, Alabama's Rich Political History. Here's Jack Royer. Welcome back. He's one of the most polarizing and influential figures in Alabama political history. George Wallace became a political juggernaut in this state by being a gifted politician. He's a man Steve Flowers knew well through sometimes tumultuous times in state history. For Wallace, success started with remembering your name. It's, an, it's a habit or a real necessity that someone in politics can remember people's names. But God just gave Wallace the ability to remember names. And one of the things that's resonated from throughout the state from my book, uh, from letters I get about people, they'll, they'll give me a story about Wallace's memory of their names. Wallace could literally meet someone at a political rally and eight years later, having met 25,000 people, could sit there and tell you, Jack, how you doing? How's your wife, Susie? You know. I met y'all at a fish fry in Sampson in 1958. I mean, it's, it's just amazing that, that, that the way he would do that. Steve, I travel around the state uh, covering news now, and men of a certain generation, women of a certain generation, you can mention George Wallace's name, and they remember meeting him. And some can say, my dad had a job in a state prison. My dad worked for the two-year college system. What does it say about a political figure that years and years after his death, years and years after his term, the effects of his work are still felt around the state, for better or for worse? Well, there's no question that, uh, uh, that if you serve as governor for four or five terms, it's 20 years, <laughs> that you're going to make the biggest imprint. I'm asked right. that quite often. I'm asked at civic clubs or some uh, interview like this, I'll be asked, well, who was the greatest, who was the most, who left the biggest legacy? Well, there's no question. It's no brainer. George Wallace, he was governor 20 years. Every junior college in the state was started by him. Every trade school was started by him. Uh, you know, he was a brilliant politician. He was a brilliant 
God-given talent. Now, did he ride the race issue? Yeah. But he was not more racist than the other people in the South. Well, that's why he was popular. Right. He was saying what people wanted to hear. That's what politicians do. They, they ride an issue. They find, Wallace used to tell me, find, find you a boogeyman and run against it. You know, he beat up on the uh, on African Americans because they couldn't vote. But when they started voting, he changed his tune. You know, to that point, you you talk about in the book how uh, he went and apologized at a church in Montgomery. Dexter King Church is old Martin Luther King's church down there on Dexter Avenue, one of the most famous churches in America, right down from the Capitol. But I'm gonna tell you something. Wallace was sincere about that. Wallace was a politician, but he he was he was in bad health because he'd been shot and everything and. Uh, but I went down to his office one day. He and I, he would call me down there to see him. I was a freshman representative, and he would call me twice a week to come in and see him. He'd tell me the same stories, and he wanted to visit me about old times. And I went out there one day, and he had, had I looked at his, his desk, and uh, there, there were no pictures. But it, he had had four or five children, had no none of his grandchildren. Pictures. The only picture he had was a, was an African American girl on his desk. And I said, Governor, who is that little girl? He says, he started crying. He says, Steve, that little girl, school girl from Birmingham came in and told me she loved me. You know? And I, I could tell then that he was, it was, a, it was a, he, he had remorse because in the height of that civil rights stuff, he probably did cause some people to get killed. I mean, there was, there were people murdered and stuff like that. These freedom riders were killed and stuff like that. And Wallace was the, was the, was the lightning rod for that stuff. He was, he ran for president on that issue, you know? So uh, he felt some remorse about it. George Wallace used to refer to me. We came from joining counties, and he would always tell me the same story, and always in part of that story, he says, Steve, you know, I'm kin to the Shepherds and Flemings in the northern part of your county. They're my kin folks, you know, and um, you know, the, I know who you're kin to, too. You know, first time he met me, he told me who he knew I was kin to. But uh, Alabama's really just kind of like a big front porch. You talk about Wallace getting out of a Cadillac and saying, boy, this is a nice car. I never get to ride in one oh, of these. Oh, yeah, you had to be poor, you know, act poor. Uh, now, they might have a, a, a Cadillac in the garage, the probate judge would. The probate judge would, in my county, for example, the probate judge had a, had a Cadillac, but he kept it in the garage and drove an old beat-up Ford to campaign in, you know. And so, you know, that was the way it was done. But you had, you had to appeal to country folks. Alabama was a country state. Tell me the proper term for the people that George Wallace had going to North Alabama and talking about what people were saying in South Alabama about him. Were they sales reps effectively for the You know, that's what you call uh, the old bandwagon effect. Mm. Now, that's true all over the country. Uh, Wallace would have this thing back in that era where he'd hire these what I call runners, and they would, they'd run all over the state pretending to be uh, fertilizer salesmen. And back then, country stores is where everything happened. Barber shops and country stores is where everybody went to campaign and talk politics. That's where Wallace would campaign. He'd go in barber shops and country stores. But Wallace would get these old country, so he knew that, so he'd get this old guy to run around the state for a couple of years before he was going to run for governor, and he'd get to know the people in the country store. He'd say, the old fertilizer salesman, he'd go to North Alabama and South Alabama, and he'd say, and they talk about the crops for about a couple of months. Everybody's crops, what's the weather doing, you know, the weather. And they talk about football, you know, and you get to know them. And finally, they got to trust him and talk politics with him. And they'd say, well, Joe, uh, what you think, what you hear, you travel all the state. And old Joe said, well, old Wallace going to get all the votes in South Alabama and do the same thing in North Alabama. He's he, got credibility. He, uh, he built credibility. And so Wallace knew that, the old bandwagon effect. Wallace told me. He learned his lesson about endorsing somebody. He'd say, if you want to help somebody in politics, say they're going to win, not you for them. Mm -hmm. And I tell people that who come to me, want me to write good things about them. They'll, if they want to run for statewide office, they're already coming to me for from, from my column. You know, I'm in 360,000 papers a week, and so they all want to come see me right now. And I'll say, well, the best way I can help you is say you're going to win. Would, would people rather vote for a winner than a good winner? That's what I'm my mama said, used to tell me, I said, I don't want to throw my vote away. Wow. The old country folks said, I don't want to throw my vote away. I'd vote for the old, I'd vote. Bentley had the same thing happen in the governor's race. People liked old Bentley to begin with. Mm -hmm. The same thing holds true. They liked old Bentley, and they'd say, well, I, that old doctor, I like him. I'd vote for him, but he can't win. I don't want to throw my vote away. And when they saw I could win, it was a bandwagon. You campaigned for Wallace as a little boy. <laughs> you couldn't vote for him, but you campaigned for him. My paper route, I had a paper route around my neighborhood and 
on my paper route was my probate judge and my representative. They were my neighbors, and Mr. Gardner Bassett was my representative. We had from my county, and he was my best friend. We became best friends because he knew how I liked politics. And so, and he says, hurry up with your route. I got a trip for us to Montgomery. I said, okay. So I got my paper route finished, and I got, we got in his car, and I said, well, where are we going, Mr. Mr. Gardner? He said, we're going to see the governor. Wallace was in his first term. He was just bouncing around. He was full of vim and vigor. If you fast forward 20 years later, I'm now 30, and I'm uh, his representative. Is that surreal in a way? It's, it tickled him. He thought it was the funniest thing in the world. Coming up, from then to now. The ethics laws came in the 70s, and now me and media came along, and if anybody thinks they're going to steal money in politics, now they've got to find another way to do it the plight of the modern-day Alabama politicians and what they can learn from our past when this WVUA 23 News special continues. You're watching a WVUA 23 News special, Alabama's rich political history. Here's Jack Royer. Finally tonight, it can be the biggest asset or liability for the modern-day politician. Television changed the way candidates campaigned and the way voters made decisions, even in the reliably red Yellowhammer State. From town square rallies to the tube, how new media created a new era for Alabama politics. You know, television reveals a lot about people. You can, it's, it's an interesting medium. You can, you, can, you can tell, you can pick up people, people's characters, whether they sinister or something on television. Uh, and I think that people, you know, come across well on, on television or that's the way they campaign now. They don't campaign like they used to, you know, that being one-on-one. -on -one, that's the only way people get to meet people now is on television. Invariably, I always got this question at the end of a Rotary Club speech I went to. Bentley's thing was on everybody's mind. They were falling, well, what about Bentley? What about, what about all that stuff he's doing? I, I finally took up for old Bentley. I said, well, you know, I've been following this stuff for 50 years. And uh, my observation is that we really ain't got to have a governor in Alabama. Big Jim stayed drunk his whole second term. Wallace was on pain pills, didn't know where in the world he was. Fob James went duck hunting the whole time. They put poor Hunt and Sigelman in jail. At least all Bentley's done is his girlfriend run the state. I mean, you know, there ain't nothing to it. I mean, uh, that's the least he's done, you know. <laughs> you know. Anyway, you know, people, people didn't know Big Jim stayed drunk his whole time. I right. mean, you know, he was, people didn't know it. There was no, yeah. the country people didn't believe it. And uh, until he got t on TV drunk in 62, running for governor, they didn't, they just thought all they were saying that about Big Jim because he wanted to help the little man. And, uh, and Wallace, they didn't know Wallace was incoherent. I knew it. I saw him every day. You know, he, he'd tell me the same story over and over again. He couldn't hear what I was saying, so I knew he was like he was talking to, you know, a, a, some old guy in a nurse home. He, he didn't know what he was doing. How does today's political climate, nationally or in the state, compare to the ones you grew up with, the ones you studied as a kid? Well, the difference is, too, you, you didn't have an ethics law back in the old days. You know, they, it was expected you'd steal money if you were in politics, and that was just, everybody knew that, you know, uh, if you were county commissioner or probate judge or whatever you were, that you know you got kickbacks and stuff like that. And I mean, uh, but then the ethics laws came in the '70s, and now me and media came along. And if anybody thinks they're going to steal money in politics, now they've got to find another way to do it. Do you think politicians in this state have a trust issue with voters, with constituents? I, I've got when I leave my 16-year tenure out of the uh, out of the uh, resume because. People will look at you funny, like you in politics, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's it's better to say you're Alabama's leading political columnist, and you're in 66 papers, and 306,000 people read you a week, and you know you have a syndicated radio show, and you're the authority on Alabama politics. That that resonates a lot more than 16 years in legislature. They assume anybody who's in politics now is a crook. Right. So it's it's a sad thing if I have a young person like you, who let's say you want to be a career a uh, journalist or a lawyer, uh, and you say, well, I might want to get in politics. As soon as you put your name on the ballot, they're going to think you're a crook. I hate to tell you that. No, yeah. People, and it's not just Alabama, but I mean, there really is not a, a lot of respect for being, I mean, I will be at a cocktail party, and someone will say, well, I've, I've read your column. Uh, I, I like, you know, talk, I like what you say about politics, and you, you're candid. And I say, well, you know, I serve in the legislature, and they look, look at me like, Oh, you went to jail, you know, like, you know, like. 
<laughs> oh, they, they say go qu quiet. You're like, oh, oh, you in the legislature. <laughs> wow. <laughs> like you, you know, oh, oh, I'm sorry you spent 16 years in jail. Right. I mean, you know, they think. How you, was your time? Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. terrible to you say that. served 16 years? <laughs> you know. <laughs> the last few years, maybe the last decade or more, in Alabama politics, especially for governors, has been at times a dark spot. We've got one still in prison. We've got one now that uh, is controversial, to say the least. Are times different in that today with social media, with the media being a powerful entity that it is, do politicians' mistakes get noticed a lot more, broadcast a lot more than they used to? How, how is it different for a politician today who uh, makes some mistakes in his personal life, in his political life? You hit the nail around the head. The, the times have changed that people know personal foibles about someone's life instantly by social media, by media. Uh, back during the time when Big Jim Foltzman and Wallace were coming into politics, Jack, there was no television. There was no talk radio, much less internet or social media. All they had was a country band and coming to a square and campaigning, and they had the big city papers or little type papers, and they wanted those little papers for them. They didn't care about the Birmingham News. They wanted the Blunt County and or the or the Northport News or the Sand Mountain Reporter. They wanted those papers. So having said that, uh, you know, all this stuff has happened with Bentley during this year and to last year or two uh, has been just so focused that that's all people think about about Bentley, poor old guy. You write, <laughs> you write about six decades of colorful Alabama political stories. Six decades from now, when there are more characters, more books written and more to talk about, how do you want to be remembered? Well, I'll probably be remembered for recording history, mm -hmm. you know, the, the recording that era of Alabama politics when uh, it was a different era that folks in my generation grew up seeing when they, they actually came to country, uh, the bands came to town and uh, people remembered people's name. It was retail politics and uh, that sort of thing. I think uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad I wrote the book to capture that era. You know, that's, that's the reason I wrote the book. For more stories and an even greater history of Alabama politics, check out Steve's book of Goats and Governors, Six Decades of Colorful Alabama Political Stories. It's published by New South Books. You can order it online at Steve's website, steveflowers.us. You can also catch him talking politics many nights right here on WVUA 23. And with that, we wish you a happy Labor Day weekend and thank you for watching. WVUA 23 News returns tomorrow night at 5. Until then, for everyone here, I'm Jack Royer. Thanks for watching. Good night.